Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante, wikibon.org, and this is theCUBE, where we go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise, we bring you the best guests that we can find. We like to call them tech athletes. I'm here with my co-host, Jeff Frick. Doug Leone is here. He's a partner at Sequoia Capital, very well-known VC, uh, on the board of ServiceNow. Doug, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. So it's great good to, to be here. It's great to have you here. You know, a lot of times, uh, venture capitalists, they'll get in, they'll help seed the companies, help grow the companies, go to, go to an IPO, successful IPO, and kind of go on to the next one. So you're here, and uh, you're seeing the growth of this company, the meteoric rise, and you see this user conference. Um, you must be delighted to see the, the, the degree, the enthusiasm of the user base. It's very exciting. Uh, it's very exciting to be here and see close to 4,000 people being here and hearing some of the feedback from the customers. It's terrific. So how is it that, uh, that they've been able to keep you interested in, in this journey and you know, you're still here, you're helping you know, grow the company? Well, I think the short answer is that the, the, the job is not done yet. Um, we, we are in the early innings. Uh, if one thinks about IT service management, we're well on our way, but one thing we learned from the conference is that customers are finding many use cases for the software. Uh, and the software is spreading in IT, in HR, in many other areas. So I actually think we're in the early innings. And so I think there's a great deal of opportunities for the company and I would like to very much try to help in uh, garner as much market share in that opportunity as we can. Yeah, you've been around the technology industry for a while. Why is it do you feel that IT is now ready to change? Well, I, I think IT is ready to change for the simple reason that the world has changed. If you think of IT maybe four or five years ago, uh, essentially what the role of IT was a defensive role to protect the enterprise, and the employees and the technology were enclosed in four walls, and a little bit on your tax side, where no was the first answer and, and yes was the other answer. And they worked mainly in infrastructure. I think of that as the plumbing. Well, suddenly, the, the role of the CIO has completely changed. The defensive part of the house has become much more challenging. The technology is out of the building and the employees are out of the building. So that requires a lot more skill set and it's way more exciting. And the plumbing side of the house has completely changed where the CIO is no longer the plumber, he's a business partner. So his role has been elevated within a corporation and I think it's the most exciting time to be a CIO in the history of, of CIOs. So I think that the future is very bright for this market segment. Lastly, for the very first time, the IT function touches every employee in a company. And so th there's a lot to be done for every employee. We, we talk a lot on theCUBE about the whole hyperscale trend and, and my colleague John Furrier says, if you want to know what's going to happen in the enterprise five years from now, go look at what's happening at you know, Google and Facebook and, and Amazon. And, you, you remember after the, the, the dot-com crash and you know, Nick Carr wrote his famous book, Does IT Matter? Everybody just pulled back, like you said, got defensive. But the hyperscale crowd showed us that technology actually can be used to create competitive advantage. Uh, nonetheless, a lot of traditional IT has continued to be defensive. Do you think that platforms like ServiceNow can actually change that mindset and bring IT back to being a competitive advantage and also importantly, catalyze increased spending within IT? Well, I actually would take it one step further. I think that companies like ServiceNow offer a product that are extremely necessary for IT to change. I don't think it can be done without a ServiceNow. For the very first time, we have employees that can create applications on the fly. They can create application, many applications that talk to one another in a single type of a data model, therefore the ERP for IT. Uh, and instead of uh, the end users having to wait weeks, months for any changes, that can be done very quickly, very overnight by a user. So I think having learned a little bit from Amazon and from Google uh, in the expectations of the end user within a corporation, a company like ServiceNow now offers a solution where companies can make those kinds of changes and build those kinds of systems very, very quickly. So Doug, I wonder if you could talk from 
step back from kind of a VC perspective, we, where we saw a few years back, you know, tremendous uh, investment and in valuation creation in Facebooks and and Google, of course, and, and, and a lot of consumer-facing buzz, Zanga and this and that. And now, you know, it, it seems to kind of shifted back to the enterprise side. But I think what's what's interesting is how the consumerization and those applications, both in infrastructure as well as user experience, seem to really now be influencing where the enterprise side of the house is going. Can you speak to, some, to that? Sure, uh, please keep in mind that the business of investing in these small companies is a business of latency. If you invest in one year, products don't hit the market for two years later, and consumer adoption is three or four years later. And unfortunately, the venture industry tends to run with momentum investing. So, 50,000 venture guys do consumer, 50,000 venture guys do infrastructure and IT. I think the good investors have seen some of these trends uh, just begin to evolve four or five years ago and, we, and you have to be quite consistent and be true to your vision. If you start coming in to companies in infrastructure right now, one could argue that you're investing at a local maximum, maybe four or five years ago. But unfortunately, the investment industry is a momentum-driven industry for most investors. And you know, the thing that happens with momentum, you're always a little late and paying the highest price, and then the moment that you get there, that you see a peak. So I think the trick is to have careful market maps, have a clear vision, and then have Dumbo-like ears available to listen to guys like Fred Luddy, so when you run across them and they have a crystal clear vision of the future, you're ready to jump on it for the simple reason you've thought ahead and maybe it was one of your veins of your market maps. Okay. What was it when you first talked to Fred that really struck you? What was the piece of his vision that uh, resonated? Two, I think two or three things. One, he was crystal clear in what he wanted to do. Uh, and the great founders are crystal clear because they are great thinkers, they spend all the time thinking, and therefore when you spend a lot of time thinking, then what you can do is articulate in very few words. Second, Fred knew exactly as the founder of the company what his strengths were and what his strengths were not, or his weaknesses were, and he asked some of his trusted friends, investors, and colleagues to help him find people to shore up the other side. Uh, and third, he just told it like it is, no surprises. As a matter of fact, for every board meeting we went to for the first year and a half, the only surprises we got were surprises on the upside. And I will tell you, that never happened. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, you have said that the, the, the next big thing in enterprise IT really doesn't exist. You're, you're telling us now your philosophy is somewhat non-contrarian. Um, most VCs, like you said, are out chasing a trend, they're trying to uh, focus on momentum. So, so talk about that a little bit. Uh, if there is no next big thing in IT, well, how do you decide what to invest in? You said you have these market maps. Talk a little bit about that philosophy. So I, I, I think what I really said is that there's no way we know what the next big thing is. As a matter of fact, if I could articulate what the next big thing is, I'll, I'll tell you it is not the next big thing. As I said earlier in the presentation, the day before we met Fred Luddy, if you had asked me that question, I would not have told you IT service management <laughs> is the next big thing. It took Fred to come in and explain to us why that was going to be a market opportunity and we jumped on it. So if we make 10 investments, four or five fit some kind of market map, it's an extension of the world we know mobile is going to penetrate. I can tell you the real exciting investments are the ones where no one's paying attention and someone like Fred Luddy can see the future. So, there is no, so yes, there's going to be next big thing, is going to be wearable computing, is going to be Google Glass, who the heck knows. But there's going to be a founder, an entrepreneur that's going to explain to us, here's an application for Google Glass you haven't thought of, that's going to make it very clear why we want to chase that and not just wearing a pair of glasses. Mark Andreessen was on CNBC yesterday talking about the perils of public companies and, and, and basically, while it was somewhat self-serving, I, I tended to agree with a lot of what he was saying. I mean, the barriers for a public company are now so high, but now here you are with with ServiceNow, what's that experience been like taking the company public? I guess if, if you're always beating on the upside, that helps, but you know, th there's eventually going to be some bumps in the road. So what's your you know, opinion on the whole public market? You know, and what's your stance on that? Well, the, the, the position I have is that it's better to stay private because that you can do a lot more. So there's only two or three reasons to go public. One is a branding event. 
your competitors will say, oh, it's a small private company, they're running out of cash, and so on, since in your financials are not public, some customers may tend to believe it. Second, is to finance the company, although one thing I'd argue is that if you've got a great investment, there's lots of money, whether you're private or public, and third is to provide some liquidity for employees. Unfortunately, the liquidity for them is not something that happens overnight. You know, one day you go public, the next day is not the day that you sell all your shares. And so it really comes down to a branding event. And our position is keep companies private until they get very strong, practice for a year or so onto what it's like to be public, have your financial house in order, then go public and always start with a no first and move the way towards a yes because the IPO is simply a day in the life of the company as you're trying to build a great business. It's not the other way where you go public, let's all go public for the heck of it. So start with a no, justify to a yes, your life was changed and you better have control over your forecasts, your financial systems and so on prior to being public. Yeah, so ServiceNow, obviously New York Stock Exchange, selling to the you know, Global 2000, the biggest companies, that had to help from a branding standpoint. It helped a lot because all the fight in the business or in the market that was spread by our competitors were not financially viable. Well, I think the whole world sees that we are way more than financially viable. All that junk that a local salesman is going to say against another local salesman in a heat of sales situation is completely out of the market because now what you're dealing with is with facts and we knew that our facts were way better than our competitors' facts. Well, there's some ancillary benefits too. It wasn't the motivation for going public, but you've, you know, prior to going public, cash flow was king, and you had to you know, invoice a certain way, and now you've got you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in the balance sheet, and, and so you're able to, it gives you greater financial flexibility as well. Yeah, we had cash flows as a private company, and, you know, and as a public company, it's not that if you have a lot of cash that you can spend it for the heck of it. You have to justify a model why doing so is the, the right thing. Cash, cash is always available. If you have a terrific company, there's people that are willing to throw cash in bucketfuls of you, so it's not cash. Um, we talked, uh, it was interesting to hear Frank today talking about Facebook. He went public just after the first major IPO in, in technology right after Facebook. He called it the, the face plant IPO, <laughs> tongue in cheek. Um, but then of course you had Workday as well. And you guys seem to be more Workday-like, you know, kind of similar transformation even though you're going to IT. Is that a fair comparison? Yes, I, I think it's a fair comparison is that it's two fabulous SaaS companies. You know, about six months ago, if I act, if I'd asked someone what's the great, the second greatest company in the SaaS marketplace, nobody could name it. Salesforce, yeah. nobody knew, knew yeah. number two. Yeah. Now people know it's Salesforce, it's Workday, and it's ServiceNow. It's a fair comparison. I think that both companies have a very long-term market opportunities, and I think both companies have standalone possibility have the possibilities of being large and standalone companies for many years to come. So Sequoia, obviously, great firm. You know, one of the leading venture capital firms in the in, in the West Coast, uh, in the in the world. Um, what se what sets Sequoia apart? Uh, we've been in business for 40 years, and we've been on top of our game for 40 years, uh, or on top of the business, I hate calling it a game. Uh, we tend we, to hide- We like sports analogies here, that's okay. <laughs> no, there's <laughs> dangers with sports analogies because the moment I mention team and a sports team, there's only room for five people on a basketball team who starts, and at Sequoia, if you've got 10 people, we're skillful, we have room for all 10 of them. So I, I'm always a bit leery of the sports analogy. Okay. Uh, but. Uh, uh, but it's the culture, it's a culture of people that came from humble beginnings, who have a deep-rooted need to win, who have good business instincts, who are willing to learn, and who are willing to be business partners. And that's a key set of words, business partners to founders, to help them build a great business over the very long term. You've spent some time in business development and sales over the years. How has sales, or has sales, changed uh, over that time frame? Some things have, some things haven't. Uh, I remember uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, where you could not get to what we call the SMB, the small businesses, because the cost of sales was too expensive. Now, due to telesales and the internet, that you can get there. But there are some things that have not changed. If you've got a sales force, you sh they should be very well paid, they should not have a high base, they should be able to make a ton of money, sales leadership should come from a, a former salesperson, so some things have changed, and some things are deeply rooted in the DNA of a salesperson and may never change. All right, Doug Leone, we're out of time, but I want one last question is, we're observers of, of ServiceNow, outside observers, what should we be watching for? What are the things that you would ask us to, to pay attention to? What? Watch how deeply ingrained throughout the many departments of a company, 
the ServiceNow software becomes not just for IT service management, but for a variety of applications written by employees of that company for the benefit of that company. All right, Doug, thank you very much. Really uh, exciting to have you on theCUBE. Uh, great job, congratulations. Uh, as you said, you're not done yet, so uh, good luck on your, your future journey. It was really a thank you, pleasure. Nick. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, Thanks everybody, keep it right there. We will be back with our next guest. This is ServiceNow's Knowledge Conference. I'm Dave Vellante with Jeff Frick. This is theCUBE. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>